Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a good lunch. And so, I'm Kyle. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Joey. Oh, yes. Hi, I'm Joey. So we work, we both work for Egalia uh, at Compilers team. And we are going to present to you uh, about how is uh, implement one new feature of JavaScript in two VMs. And this work was mainly, uh, was done in collaboration with Bloomberg. And well, let's just start. So, um, class were, class were introduced in JavaScript back in, in EX6. So it was like, uh, some time ago. And they had the concept of methods. And with that, they also had the concept of accessors as well. So in ES6, we have the public. Now we call them public methods and, 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 and accessors, both instance and static. The idea of this new proposal of class features in ECMAScript is basically a follow up of this uh, class semantics and syntax mainly. And the idea is to have class instance fields. This includes uh, public, public fields and private fields. Also, there is a new other proposal to introduce private methods and private accessors. And the counterpart of everything is the static class features, where we have static public and private fields and static private methods as well. So that's pretty much the overview of the proposal. Right now, uh, the proposal is on stage three. Uh, so ECMA 262 has this concept of stages. And stage three mainly means that the committee, C39 committee already decide what's the design of the feature. And now JavaScript engines are kind of uh, not allowed, but at, at least they are invited to start the implementation and give feedback for the committee about what the spec is, how the spec is mainly in comparison with the web reality. So that, that's pretty much what stage three stands. And after two implementations are shipped, we are able, and other things as well, but we are able to ask for stage four in a specific proposal. Uh, well, we would like to thank Bloomberg because Bloomberg pretty much uh, worked with Galia to implement the three proposals in JavaScript core. So they are uh, sponsoring us to do that. And also sponsoring us to do uh, implementation on private methods on V8. Is, this includes also instance and static ones, and also improve the class features in Beige in general. So, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, well, let's talk about what's public field. So, this is what a public field looks like in JavaScript. So, in the line, the fifth line here, class, we have like this new synthetic formation where we have field equals count. So count is a function that is basically iterating over an incrementer. And we can see that for the first evaluation of the count, it's going to return 0, then it's going to return 1. So this means that actually uh, the initializers of the class fields are executed every time that a, a new object is created. And well, what happens is basically uh, the new object is going to contain a property named field and the initializer is going to be evaluated for that, and this is going to be installed in every single instance of this uh, object. So that's what public fields pretty much mean in a very overview uh, way. Well, we have the counterpart. Or it's not a counterpart, I would say, but it's a private field. So private fields, they do not behave like a common property in JavaScript. And so in the public fields, they actually behave like a property as well. But in the case of pub private fields, it's not true because uh, first they have like this different way of naming. They have like they start with the hash field, for example, the hash in the, it's, it's stuff in the identifier, identifier. But also, you are not able to access a private field outside the class scope, so it's impossible to write a valid program in JavaScript where the access of the hash field is like outside the class. Uh, Lexo scope. So if, if this line, for example, he turn this hash field is like outside here or like down there, it's gonna throw a, a syntax error. So the program doesn't need to compile. Uh, also, different from a public field, if you try to access a private field that is not present in the object, it actually throws a type error because, uh, it's actually invalid uh, access. 
There are a lot of reasons behind that on the TC39. I, uh, it predates my, 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 my presence there. But anyway, like, if you want more details, we can talk in private about that. Uh, but anyway, this is different from what public fields have because public fields has the semantics of looking up the property in the prototype chain. If it doesn't find anything, it's going to return and define it. So it's basically a different operation, I would say. Uh, also, uh, I think that's pretty much it about private fields. I think we should just go. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing that I was forgetting. So the point is, even though we have the hash field in the class 1, the class C, we can have a class field, uh, hash field in class D, but this means that both the names here, they are different. So if you try to access a hash field inside the class D, passing an object of class C, it's also going to throw a type error. We can see that they're actually those names, even though they're written the same, like internally they're represented differently, so they are different private names. So that's pretty much how we guarantee how a field, uh, like a different object, cannot access a field that it's not supposed to, to, to access. Well, not go giving me a lot of details, but that's how we declare private methods and also static private methods and static private fields. It pretty much follows the same thing of public and static methods, but instead of using a uh, common name, you put the hash in the front, and the hash in the front is kind of a modifier saying, okay, this is a private uh, name, a private method, and a private static method. And static fields and field, private static fields they follow the same semantic, the same syntax of the public fields, but they have the static in, in the front of that. So, and you can access, of course, the static field using the constructor name, that, like the class name dot field, for example. Okay. Um, hi. So, oh, yeah. So, um, sorry about that. Uh, so here is um, a journalized pipeline of both Drive Core and V8. So um, just a quick recap, when you execute JavaScript in JavaScript engines, you first um, in the two like in the case of JavaScript Core and V8, you first pass the source text to the parser, which produce the AST. Um, and also it feeds variables and scopes information to the um, to an analyzer which analyzes the scope information and identify early errors. Um, and then with both the ASC and the scope and verbal information, the bytecode generator is going to generate bytecode. Um, and um, depending on whether the code is hot or not, um, it may be interpreted by the interpreter, which may call into the runtime, um, or it may also be uh, compiled by the JIT compiler, which emits compiled code, which may also call into the runtime as well. So, um, so to implement the class features, first, obviously, we need to change the parser to parse these new syntaxes. Um, so, in particular, we need to support the new production hash identifier that's for the private names. Um, that's relatively easy both in JavaScript Core and V8 because they both used recursive descent parsers. So you basically just need to find the correct place to hack and add some code there. Um, and we also obviously need to new, add new AST nodes um, so that the bytecode generator can visit them later. Okay. Um, and then because um, in the private names, um, you can throw errors early on we need to modify the scope analysis quite a bit to uh, implement the semantics. So, for example, we need to specialize the resolution of print names to identify usage of undeclared fields whenever we have finished parsing a class literal. Um, so, for example, here we have the class, which has a hash field, uh, but in the method, we accidentally made a typo, which, you know, access as hash filed. So this now throws a syntax error, whereas if you do this with, for example, underscore instead of hash, uh, that means that it's a public property, then that will be like silently fail or like just silently add things to the instance because JavaScript. Um, 
So to um, implement this, we need to add additional fields to variables to carry information about the kind of property access. So for instance, for this, we need to record that this is a private property access. Um, um, and in, v in VA, we need to rewrite the scope analysis for class scopes. So previously, they are implemented the same way as normal block scopes. Uh, but in order to like implement these semantics, we need to rewrite the whole thing. Um, and also, like if you have duplicate fields, um, previously it just like suddenly used the last one. Um, but like with private names, it will throw a syntax error as well, and that's also identified during the scope analysis. Um, and also, both JavaScript Core and VA has lazy parsing. Uh, so with lazy parsing, errors are identified, and variables are serialized in the first time of the parsing. Um, so in this case, uh, when we parse the class for the first time, the field, the hash field, uh, private name is serialized. And then we don't actually emit code for this function because lazy, we're, we're being lazy here. So we only generate code for this method when they are actually invoked, which triggers the bytecode generation. And at this point, we need to deserialize um, the private names from the scope. Um, so that adds some complexity in the implementation of uh, the private names. Okay. Um, so next, we're, we need to emit new bytecodes for these new class features. Um, so we need to change the bytecode emitted for class evaluation, as well as the bytecode for the class constructors, uh, for in the case of instance private names. Uh, and we also need to modify the bytecode emitted for property access. Uh, especially for the private um, property accesses. Um, so after that, we also need to modify the interpreter. Um, so in some cases, uh, there are new operations added for, um, for example, the private field access. Uh, so we need to add new interpreter handlers for them. Um, yeah, in, in the case of JavaScript core, uh, we needed to create a new instruction called op get by vault array. And basically, this implements the semantics of if we try to figure out if a property field, a private field, is in the object, instead of returning on the finite, we need to throw type error. So that's pretty much what this operation does. Uh, there are the edgy cases why we created that, actually. Uh, but like this was one of the reasons to create this new operation as well. Um, yeah, and we also need to modify the runtime uh, to implement extra semantics. Uh, so, for instance, in V8, we need to uh, add special paths to look up private symbols, um, and that also has the different semantics that Kyle talked about earlier. Um, we also need to validate the receiver. Uh, for access to private methods and accessors. Um, and we also need to do the same for static because in the case of static, the only valid receiver is the class. Okay. Um, and then we also need to change where things are installed. So in the case of static, we need to install things on the class itself instead of the instances. Um, so next we are going to take private instance fields as an example and talk about the PyCo generated for them. Um, so, for example, uh, during class evaluation um, of a class that contains a private field, we need to emit, or we need to emit bytecode to call into a runtime function, which creates a private symbol. So, in V8, when we implement language features, we usually implement things at, in runtime functions first before we migrate things into like new bytecodes. Um, so in V8, this private name, private name, uh, private fields are implemented with private symbols, which V8 already has. Um, so we usually store them in the, in a slot of the current context, which is associated with the current class. Um, and in V8, we already statically know that which slot, like the index, um, is 
the field resides. So the context is kind of like a fixed array. So all of this is kind of like just nicely static and continuous. Um, and then we need to also in, uh, create a closure, which in V8, in the V8 backhole, is basically functions. So we need to create a function to initialize the field that we'll invoke later during our instance, uh, instance construction. So we need, we then also store this initializer onto the class using a special symbol. Um. Yeah, the high level design of uh, JavaScript core is very close to the V8 one. Uh, but we have a little bit like a, a slight different uh, thing. So we don't have this context of uh, this, this, this concept of context variables. And so what we basically do is for every class, we have a lex code scope for this class. And this is a, this is a heap object during the execution. So what we do is uh, this, basically those braces, they are going to create a new lex code scope and we are going to create a new object for that. And we install uh, the private names things into this Lexcode code scope. And what happens is, first of all, we also create a private symbol that is going to represent the private name. But we then bind this private symbol with a private name, with the same name of the, the, the private field itself. So in this case, it's hash instance field. And we put that into the scope. This scope is also used, for example, to store local variables uh, that can be captured uh, by a closure and going to be accessed inside the closure, for example. So in this case, the user never can define uh, a variable itself with hash instance field, so they are not accessible from, from user code somehow. And the point is we store this private symbol there, then we, 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 it's basically creating a new private name, and then we create the instance field initializer as well to initialize the, the, the private field in the future steps. We are going to show to you the bytecode for that as well. But yeah, pretty much following what we have in V8. So it's kind of very close to this. Okay. Um, so in V8, during the instantiation of um, the class, we uh, first load the instance member initializer from the class constructor. Um, using the symbol, uh, and then we will just call it. Um, and then in the initializer, we load the private symbol for that field from the context uh, using the syntax that is, as we mentioned, uh, statically known. So we'll just evaluate uh, the initializer, which is one in this case. So we'll load uh, an integer one, and then we'll just call into another runtime function uh, which is add private field and add the um, result of initializer to um, the instance as a single property. Yeah, so in a JavaScript core here, uh, so it, it happens during the construction of the object, so it's pretty much like the construction operation. And we also get the, the, the initializer function and we call that. And in the initializer function, we have the initialization of every field. So in the case of private field, uh, and that's the major difference from V8 is that we resolve where the field, the private symbol is stored dynamically. So we have this resolve scope. And this is going to basically like say to me where I need to find a private symbol for this private name. And then I can get this private symbol. And finally, put by Val direct is going to be responsible to basically uh, store, install the private sim the private uh, field into a specific object. So this instruction is going to pretty much do that. Uh, we have some difference, like this was instruction already in JavaScript core. We actually need to change a little bit uh, using the flags. You can see like private name and throw if exists here. So the idea is pretty much like when you redeclare a private name, you actually should throw an error. And we changed the semantics of this operation just to, to do that as well. Uh, and that's what, uh, that, that pretty much finishes what we do for a construction in JavaScript core private fields uh, initialization. Okay, so, um, when we evaluate access to um, a private field in V8, we load the private symbol uh, from the context slot, as what we mentioned earlier. Um, and then we'll just load it using the load key property instruction, which is also 
used when you access a property using the bracket. Um, so in the eight, um, we mod like the the IC the inline cache for this instruction is modified so that it errors if the field does not exist. It does not continue looking up in the prototype, uh, or like it does not return undefined if it cannot find it. Yeah, here is the place where we use this new uh, instruction that we mentioned before. So uh, we also get the private field, and again, we, we need to resolve the scope to find out where is it. And I can show cases where this is useful because, like, look at this at first time doesn't maybe be so obvious. Then you can get this uh, get from scope the private symbol and access that using get by val direct. And just to reinforce, this is gonna throw if you if you can find the private name into the object itself. Uh, so other class features are also implemented using the infrastructure we talked about earlier. So um, private methods are shared among the instances. So we basically do the same thing as um, like during class evaluation time as the private fields. But um, the validation of the receiver is guarded by per class special symbol property instead of, like we don't assign different symbols for different private methods. We just use one symbol per class uh, to check the receiver, whether the receiver is valid. Um, so when also when implementing static features, they're also sim implemented similarly to um, instance features uh, with the difference that they're handled during class evaluation time instead of in the constructor. Okay, um, so the status, the current status of the innovations uh, are so in the eight uh, in Chrome, the class fields including public, static, and static uh, public, private, and static class fields have already been shipped uh, in seventy four. Uh, the private methods, private accessors, as well as the static private methods and accessors are currently under the flag dash dash harmony dash private methods uh, so they're already fully implemented in the master and they're feature complete yeah in the case of webkit uh, we also have work in progress this work in progress actually majorly means that we have the paths there ready to be reviewed so if you want to follow uh, the development of this on, on safari on webkit in general you can just follow the, the, the bugs or oh, can talk with me later and I can share the links where this is happening. But if you have access to the bugzilla, you will already uh, be able to see the changes we made to support those features. And yeah, we are waiting for a review uh, in the class fields, mainly because we did a lot of refactoring last week. Uh, also, I already uh, uh, did some stuff for the methods, the private methods itself, so it's also ready to re be reviewed. But the one is dependent on another, so I, I don't think it's going to happen in parallel anyway. And accessory is there, uh, needs to be rebased based on, on the new things we have on uh, class views as well. And the static feature is also ready to be reviewed and upstream in the bugzilla. So that's pretty much it. Well, uh, we mentioned later about the stage three being the, the step where implementers go to feedback to the committee. And those are two examples of issues that, like very edgy cases that we could find while implementing. And we gave feedback to, to, to the spec, uh, about what we could, how we could handle that. And if you want to follow the discussion, the detail of every, every decision we took, you could just follow those issues on GitHub. And I'm not going to give details on them, but it kind of made some changes in, in the spec somehow. And in terms of uh, test status, in ECMA 262, we have this repository, test 262, that basically is testing uh, the spec somehow. So it, 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 if an implementation is implementing JavaScript, it can use this test, test 262 to see and assure, uh, kind of assert how close it is to with the spec itself. Of course, there are some cases we are not catching that. But anyway, it's the best source that we have right now to figure out if we are spec compliant or not. So we needed to write tests for that as well for the class fields. And well, it's already complete. So we got actually the bug closed last week and it introduced around 6,000, uh, 6,300 new tests for, for this suite. 
So it was a big chunk of code and big, big chunk of work to done, but a lot of people were involved in that anyway. So yeah, that's, that's the status of tests right now. Any questions? How um, about performances? Did you did you try to benchmark your two implementations and, and compare? Or if you didn't, do you have a feeling of if uh, one or the other engine would be faster? Do you want to answer that? <laughs> Since we implement the uh, uh, things basically the same way, I suspect there will be like significant, um, like significant difference in terms of mm -hmm. performance compared to what they because like for example the uh, profiles are sugar to single property access, so that kind of depends on which engine performs better mm -hmm. in terms of single property access. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, you could. You could do that. I would suspect they have the same performance numbers, but you can perform as like simple property access already, like with using public symbols in JavaScript. And if, for example, V8 is fresher than JavaScript core on that, you would expect that uh, the implementation of the private fields on V8 is going to be faster than the implementation of JavaScript core, for example. Uh, because it's, it's, it's basically using pretty much every, every single machinery that we already had, like we already had in JavaScript core, and it's, I think V8 as well, private symbols. And we just reused that. And we need to change some uh, very, very, very uh, a small amount of, of, of OP, OP codes just to be aligned with the spec. Because, of course, we couldn't preview what the spec would look like. And yeah, th those changes were necessary. But I, I don't think they impact a lot the, the performance of the implementation in general. And there are some things on GSC because we resolve the scopes dynamically right now. That, that's different from V8. And this totally could be implemented as, uh, a static, uh, in lookup. I think so. Maybe it is possible. And this would make things faster because like, anyway, even though we can cache the lookup of our dynamic variable and like this resolve scope and get from scope can be cached after first run, you still have like the overhead of looking up into the map where this this variable is stored and then caching that for this the, 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 the further access in wait. So maybe this can be an optimization to, to be done. Any more questions? <laughs> and some classes access private fields or private methods. Um, I guess no one is there something like uh, protected fields or protected or something like this. Uh, do you mean like whether the like how are the private methods are protected? Yeah. So well, I, I guess that if you define a uh, private field, for example, in a class, and then you have a subclass or this class, then ah, right. this subclass you cannot access the private field, right? Um, so, yes. so the private names in JavaScript are lexical in that if you can see it, if you are in the scope where the private name is not heard, then you can access it. So if you have um, the subclass in some methods inside the outer class, then you can see the methods, uh, then you can see the private names in the outer class. But if you have that somewhere else, like if you define the class subclass extends base class, then no, you cannot see it because it's not in the perfect instances where the um, it's not in uh, braces where the current name is defined. So basically just follow the rules by looking at braces. Yeah, it's also like you can have the case where, depending on what you are mentioning about access, but if you have like a member of a class that extends another class, and you have a method in the base class, for example, that access a private field in this base class itself, so it's a valid program because you're not like uh, accessing an invalid private name, uh, so whenever you call this method installed for, for the base class, you are also able to access the private field. But like, you need to have like the lexical scope properly configured, you know? So, yeah, this is probably like the case. I, I don't think we were thinking the case specifically, but Joey just mentioned that case where you can do that for sure.
Thank you very much.